Well, I just know with somebody too who like the way that I learn things is by doing them. Like watching somebody do something, I'm not going to get a lot out of. No. So for me, hanging out in a studio, if I'm not actively recording something, I'm just killing time. Yeah, yeah it's a bit uh, boring too, to be honest. Like it's, yeah. it's overrated in terms of like having a whole band at one session. Sometimes they want to come and watch. Yeah. See what goes into it if it's new to them. So that's, sure. that can be fun too. But yeah, I'm always of the mind of like, just the less people, the better. Get to work faster. Yeah. Sing it again and then and then sing it. Great. Done. Next. Because then uh, other times people have suggestions. There's too many suggestions coming in. So you have to kind of manage like making sure everyone has, the other bandmates have their suggestions, but not aggravate the singer. Because that could be tricky. So yes, we could do totally. a whole chapter on stuff like that. But uh, I, I don't know what this podcast is about. <laughs> I'm just talking about everything. Hello, 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 everyone. How you doing? Uh, hello to you from foggy St. John, New Brunswick, Canada. Hope you're doing well on this. Here it's a gray, cloudy uh, midday. I guess it's not really morning or afternoon. I guess it technically is afternoon. Uh, so t- this week on the show, we've got John Mullane of uh, the band In Flight Safety. Now a um, producer, recording engineer, does scoring, recording, composing for film and TV. We talk about all of that. I had a different intro clip picked out, but I liked that one because it kind of sums up a lot of what's going on this season of the show, <laughs> where I uh, wanted to kind of expand it, make it in, in what seems to me a bit more useful or certainly more interesting to me talking to different people who are working in the music business on the East Coast for a few different reasons. One of them being I'm not really interested in either being pigeonholed as a drummer or uh, being stuck in that role. I want to be able to do things besides play the drums. I want to be able to talk about things other than play the drums. But as I kind of was thinking about it today, I realized that it does go hand in hand. The drummer is classically the business guy in the band, and there are all kinds of different reasons why that may be. Uh, There's no one conclusive reason. Things I've heard from friends have been, well, like this person's working hard writing songs and I'm not doing that, so I can pitch in in this way. I also think there is something about being in that role where you're at the back of it, uh, back of the stage conducting traffic as opposed to being in the front of the stage. Like it's not really a look at me kind of position. It's more a supporting role and a, uh, a strategic role, which I think goes hand in hand in how do we make this thing, this machine that is a band work. All that to say, if you're a drummer, there is a good likelihood that this stuff is on your mind as well as um, th- the technical side of playing the drums. However, the danger of that is that the show could lose its focus. If it's not a drummer show, then what is it? Anyhow, r- related to that, on my mind this week are a bunch of things. Number one, I feel like I'm just done with social media. I really trimmed back my um, Learn Drums online brand. My Instagram, I deleted everything that was not the 31 Days of Drum Tips uh, project that I did in January which was the thing that I did directly before I launched season two of this podcast, actually. And I think, as I mentioned before on the show, my initial idea was to make a website that would take you through your first bit of drum lessons. So that's what that is now. And um, it's liberating, honestly. It both is... um, Because I've I've had people say to me, you know, I don't really know what Learn Drums is at this point. And it kind of lost its functionality for me, too, where I originally was just trying to find students locally Uh, I'm no longer trying to do that, so why do I still have this Instagram account? But you have it, so you have to keep updating it. Um, Now I don't. No more posts, just the ones that are there. Same as my website is like scaled back hugely. I was doing a blog. I was trying to, you know, you read all these things that tell you you need to be putting out content constantly. So that was what I was trying to do. But again, it becomes a thing that you need to maintain. Uh, Number two comes from Seth Godin. 
who's a bit of a business guru himself, who says, um, you know, do you know the difference between an entrepreneur and a freelancer? Do you know which one you are? Because entrepreneurs are people who figure out what the work is that needs to be done, assemble a group of people to do it, but they don't actually do the work themselves. Freelancers are people who are their own free agent. They do the work on their own. And as musicians, that's what most of us are, but we're told that we're entrepreneurs, that that's what we need to be, that we are not only trying to create art, our music is a business, you are a business. So you are both, you know, essentially CEO and product or service. Are you a product or a service? Do you even know? Have you thought about the difference between those two things? Do you care? As soon as you get out and you start trying to make your project work, you get confronted with perhaps the reality, perhaps the necessity, certainly the opinion that you are a business, you need to wrap your head around that. If you're failing, it's your fault. Having done the band thing, run the gauntlet a little bit, I'm not entirely convinced that what we were trying to do was actually possible. You know, I think at one time it was, and I think unfortunately our band coincided with some shifts in the music industry itself, certainly on the East Coast. So what I wanted to do with this show is talk to people who are doing music on the East Coast. What are we doing? How does it work? Like, am I, you know, am I delusional? I don't have the answer to that question. I do have ADHD, which I discovered earlier this year. Then I started noticing the traits in a lot of my musician friends. And initially I was like, well, does everybody have it? Is this made up? But then the more I thought about it, the more I thought that actually it's more likely that people with this condition end up in these kinds of uh, occupations. You know, cause for me, it's like I, I can become anxious. I um, have these obsessive tendencies, which we do also get into in this conversation. But part of um, one of the symptoms of ADHD is hyper-focus. Like I can sit in front of the computer if I'm engrossed in a task for hours. Last night, I sat in front of my computer for six hours editing this show that you're about to listen to. Part of the reason is that when I record these interviews, I don't always follow the thread of the conversation exactly. And so you can hear the sort of point where my brain catches. There's one in the intro right here, which I thought about editing out, but I um, instead thought it was kind of funny. But again, to the point of, well, I'm an, am I an entrepreneur or a freelancer? If I'm editing my own podcast, uh, I'm obviously a freelancer. But we're nearing the end of season two, my friends. Thanks so much for being here. Looking forward to being done with this workload. Got a bunch of gigs coming up in the month of June. I'm playing with the Bad Religion cover band on guitar. We did it as a, a one-off last year, and it was the first time I ever played guitar in a band on stage, which was fun. So uh, that's happening again in Halifax at the Seahorse on the 13th of June, playing with Valerie at the Seahorse on the 20th of June. Uh, potentially a Green Day cover band, which is another kind of reunion. I play the drums for a band in which we covered the entire Dookie album. I'm DJing again on June 14th here in St. John at Taco Pica. I've got my own stuff that I'm working on. I've been playing drums in a ska band. I don't know if that's secret, but um, you don't know more than that. It's a lot. And then so to be... While I love doing the show, uh, to, to be taking up that amount of my free time to edit the thing is a little much. I don't even mind doing the work, although I will say that I'm loath to dig into it most of the time. Anyhow, that's enough out of me. You're going to be listening to me for the next hour. So here it is, me and John Mullane. Are we allowed to talk about where we are? Yeah. Yeah, because we're like in 
a nook in a hotel. Yeah. It's Beach, like, and we have a fern between us. Yeah. I don't know what the purpose of this room would actually it's, be. It's for this podcast. Right. <laughs> We've got a lamp. <laughs> and we have a fern. So I think, uh, yeah, Zach Galifianakis might sue us, but we're good. He can't see this. The amount of money you're going to make off this mm. should justify him suing you. I have a... Uh, it's giving me a lot to think about. <laughs> I say I was thinking the opposite of like the amount of money that he's going to make off of. Right. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Not too much. No, I wouldn't. Uh, I don't know that it would be worth his while. <laughs> maybe. Maybe it is. Zach, if you're out there, I gave Dave Grohl a writing credit on a song on a few episodes ago that okay. I like. I ripped off like a Foo Fighter song off the first album. Okay. To make actually the theme song, although it's like I use an instrumental version. Right. Uh, so you don't hear it anyway what song oh, no we can't say that oh it's just like an original tune that i did oh, okay well i'm a fan of that song you put out man that's the one yeah the Spank. panic tune well i didn't hear any foo fighters in that oh the chorus is like lyrically it's a direct rip off okay. and i kind well, of wrote doesn't, a song it doesn't, about it, uh, around it it doesn't uh play that way isn't that oh, interesting cool. i mean i know foo fighters early foo fighters but yeah it just yeah. sounds sounds like you yeah oh cool. thanks man yep yeah well i was, was like the joke was like like have fun cashing those royalty checks, Dave. Like, <laughs> also, uh, t- like we'll probably get into more music stuff here, but just t- how much you can steal before it sounds like the actual thing you stole from is That's, funny. Because uh-huh. in your brain, you're like, oh God, I just ripped off this melody, but it doesn't sound like so that. So obvious. Out of context, and when you kind of do your own thing, it's totally new. So we are here in Charlottetown because of the East Coast Music Awards, East Coast Music Week. I think they tried to rebrand it as ECMW, and nobody was having it. I think it we went back to ECMA. Yeah. yeah. Which is equally confusing because A can be association yeah. or awards. Uh, which do you prefer? ECMA. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is. Would you rather be part of an association or win an award? I, I, yeah, awards are good. Uh, yeah, good for good for uh, getting your name out. You've got a couple of ECMAs. Am I correct in saying that? In my, in my, uh, my house, yeah. Uh-huh. He's sitting in, uh, gallantly in the bottom of a closet. <laughs> Uh, uh, I don't know what to do. You know, like, you're going to show them to friends. They're not going to. It's weird. I'm proud of them. Uh-huh. hundred percent. But I, do, I just, I'm just know that we got them. And I don't even have them all because some of the other band members took some of them. Right. And I don't know what, whose houses they're at. So I have a couple at, at home. Maybe my kids will see them in a few uh-huh. years and be like, oh, you did something once. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it is cool. I, I think I, it's yeah, like. Yeah, I'm not going to knock it. I'm really proud of them. And especially yeah. Glenn and I are, uh, when we talked about this last, Glenn, years ago. Most proud of uh, the last one we won was for album, and I'm most proud of that because it's always about the work, right? Absolutely. Not like great group of the year. It was like no, it was about the album, and that one really made us happy. Um, and that is for your work with In Flight Safety. Yeah, or- In Flight Safety on that record was conversationalist. That last one that we uh, put out, and that came out when 2014. And that record, if I'm not mistaken, like what was the process? Of that one, because I, I thought it was like kind of different. Like it was a bit different. That record kind of underwent during the making of that record. We underwent like a lineup change, and like every band does at some point, I guess. But or most. Um, so we started making a record as like the original lineup was just not going great, and no one reason. But we kind of finished about a record's worth of material, and then I remember I'm going back a bit here, but I think it was the Christmas of 2012. I listened to what we had sort of demoed. And I was like, it was like right around Christmas, and I was just panicking because I was like, I, I don't know what this is. I do not understand what this music is. And we had done like a year of writing and right. a bit. Is year, that just year plus? You, yeah. I didn't like it. I didn't. And I'm a real why, quote, why, end quote kind of guy. Like, uh-huh. what, like, what's the why here? And I did not understand it. It sounded like in flight safety, it sounded like we were doing a rip on. Two hours traffic meets Phoenix, but we're not doing it well. It was like I don't know what this is. Uh, the work wasn't uh, wasn't ready, in my opinion. Uh huh. So yeah, it sort of kickstarted a chain of events of like we're going to move on as a two piece, and it's no one's going to want to rewrite this whole thing. But I kind of need to. And yeah, we did, we did keep destroy, which is one of the singles from that record. Yeah, yeah. From that early version of the record, totally. But then we burnt down almost everything else, uh, or at least uh, quite a bit of it. Yeah. Or re or re we changed it. Uh-huh. Yeah, I think we had destroyed maybe a version of animals at that point. Yeah. Okay. And did you re-record stuff or just yeah, re? Yeah, we yeah. did it all again. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and glad I went back to work, just like writing in a different way. So mm-hmm. that was nice too. Like we were writing with the computer, like so, just chopping up drums 
to the patterns he wanted and I would be able to hear more of the basic idea. So it was just getting a bit too, when you work in a band sometimes, you're like pi- piling ideas on ideas and you just can't hear the message. Mm-hmm. But it sounds good, but then you're like, well, what is this really? Yeah, mm-hmm. and that's where we got stuck down a bit of a... We did quite a few sessions like just jamming together, like like old school, but they just... We had a bunch of stuff, but not really songs. So yeah, well, it's the hard thing about like about bands too. Is just keeping like generally when a band starts, everyone's on the same page in terms of what they want to do, and then for sure time goes on, people get into different things, or even the like differences between them maybe grow more pronounced. It's like you just are into another version of the same thing you used to be into, or yeah. like one person wants to move on, one person wants to get back to totally, yeah. Yeah, one person wants to get back to a certain thing, or or in, in the case of I think us at the time, some people were kind of like, "This is what I do," so it puts them in an awkward spot. Like I'm asking them to do things they don't do, and that gets weird. And so at some point, you have to kind of like figure out what it is you want to do, and and how prepared you are to, you know, dig yourself a bit more of a hole is what I called it at the time. Of like, you know, we have to go down the the hole, the abyss a little further, then come out like because we uh-huh. had thought we were done the digging and we were like digging ourselves out now and getting this record ready. But uh, I, I kind of knew at some point in the back of my mind, it's not, we're not having gone deep enough on this yet, <laughs> especially we're a band that's been a lot around for at the time, you know, like 10 years, like uh-huh. you can't just put out a record that doesn't have some very specific intention and, and uh, songs that really kind of push the band forward. So it's got to it, push it forward. Yeah. I felt, I felt it wasn't doing that. And, but I also understand that people who were in the band at the time were like, this is crazy. Totally understand that. Mm-hmm. Yep. Sure. Yeah. I mean, again, that is the hard thing. I know, like, our band certainly went through that, mm-hmm. where, um, you know, people get sick of uh, what you're doing, and then other people aren't sick of it yet. Yeah. And, um, and it does, you do also get to a point where the there's a while where you were just enjoying like writing stuff and putting it out, and that whole process is fun and exciting. And then it does hit a point where, well, this next release needs to do something for us. Yeah, and, and, and I guess the way that we would frame it is um, we had a certain amount of success like in a kind of commercial sense at the time that we were just trying to maintain. Yeah. It wasn't like we were going to try to blow through the next echelon of success but it was it's, it, it's always been this way even at the at the expense of in some cases of, of commercial success it's always been like artistically mm-hmm. is this where it needs to be like is this is and that was always the guide the guiding light for us um and i speak for me and, and i know glenn too uh, but like yeah it was like if it's not artistically in something interesting like or that i feel is interesting mm-hmm. someone else might not like it um but if I didn't feel like, yeah, it was like it combined some ideas that I thought were strong, then it was just really never going to fly anyway. So. Well, because the, then what's the point? Like, You're not going to so go on tour work. with songs you don't like. <laughs> it's already, it's been 10 years. It's not going to happen. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we, we dug deeper and that that's how that record was born. And it took a little while to find like label partners and get that organized. And we just, it took a long time. So it was like five years between records at that point, which is not a good career move right. for a band that had done what we'd done with the We Are an Empire. Um, was really, but again, we've always sacrificed career moves to try to get songs that we liked. Yeah, and that's unfortunate, but uh, for some things, but that's the way it went. Yeah. In some ways, but in other ways, the, the the reverse of it is like if you put out subpar songs in favor of yeah. chasing a career, like is that an actual path to a career? I don't, I don't know. I just think that you need to find a combination of right. Steady you can't wait five product. years between records if you're trying to, you know, maintain a career. It's yeah. too long. Uh, I, though some people have done it, you know, it's just you need money coming in and people yeah. have things to do and people have other jobs and you got to really keep that. And also you're going to lose a bit of your fan base. And, yep. and again, rightly so. It's taking too long. We went under, underwent quite a few changes, but when it came out, it felt pretty much like every other record. Yeah. Yep. Exciting and, you know. Always, always hope to land like a few film and TV placements with our first little push of a record. So, we always were hoping for that kind of stuff. Uh huh. Because that's how we we would make most of our career was through film and TV. Interesting. Other bands would be like um, live show. Yeah. But for us, we we played live and did okay. Yeah. It was like film and TV was the big part, and then selling recorded music too. Yeah. Which really kicked our ass in the streaming era because we were like a we were a recorded band. Like you bought our records. Yeah. And we we did okay with that. Yeah. But. 
live show was more like, hey, we'll play live because you know the record. Right. It wasn't like, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna, you're gonna see this show and it's gonna change your life. It's like we're just gonna play these songs uh-huh. and we're gonna play them really well. But like that was kind of the concept behind the band. So the streaming era was really tra- challenging at that time. I bet. It was like you well, saw the recorded music revenues go down a bit. Yeah. Especially, and I'm just thinking of as you're talking, like with the album format, also because the another thing that streaming has wrought is like. The, like people do still put out albums, mm-hmm. but it, it once it's separated from the physical object, it can be listened in any con- yeah any like and especially the way Spotify works, where it's like just as your top track. So one song from the new album was is in our top tracks, and then other old songs. So it's just a it's a different different time then. But yeah, we I mean we made uh, we had a good album cycle with Conversationalist and traveled, and that's all you really hope for anyway. Yeah, and, it and, is. And, and, you know, play to your fans and. And um, try to make new ones where possible, and you know, get get to Texas to eat barbecue and play shows. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a privilege to do that stuff, especially now that I'm not traveling the world uh, as much because I'm home with my uh, my family, my kids, um, and in the studio. But uh, so yeah, looking back, it's even easier to see how privileged I was to be able to travel so much. And, you know, right. It's weird how when you're away from it, you can really quantify it. And yeah. Even the thing I said about uh, having to rewrite the record is only something I kind of came up, up, up with right now. I was like, oh yeah, like asking people to, I knew, I knew that asking people to rewrite that record was going to end that relationship, but I only really thought of that right now on the right. spot because I've been far enough away. Uh-huh. I would have framed it slightly differently back then. Like I was like, well, it was a tough time, yep. but now I can see pretty clearly that was what was going on. Yeah. Right. Funny. Because we're that far away from well, and that's what it takes sometimes. I know like when Glory Glory broke up, yeah. there's like a lot of people, you know, it's funny because because then you get the people's reactions. There's the people who don't know that you broke up. There are the people who are like, but you were so successful. Mm-hmm. Then the people who were like sad about it. Mm-hmm. And you're like, you're really sweet. Unfortunately, I can't make my career off of you. And, <laughs> and honestly... For me, I, I can't even speak for the rest of the band, but for me, it was like, you mean walk away from this endless cycle of work that is just never enough and it's never, it's like you're so far from where you need to be. Yep. Um, so did that feel good for you to do that? Like to, At the time. Yeah. Yeah. Like, hundred percent. Just let, it, let that stress go. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's funny too, because with Glory Glory, you got, I, I was a big fan. Um, uh, and, and to be fair, especially at the late, I didn't know the early stuff. I didn't No, but it, I knew I mean, of that you guys existed, but I love what you guys were doing at the, the last round of stuff. Oh, thanks. Man. Um, and I tell you guys that all the time and stuff, whatever I was at the shows, but, uh, you guys are the funniest band when you broke up because I've never seen a band break up and then just like still be hanging out and stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've never seen that before. <laughs> At least not everyone. It's the weirdest. Yeah. Like, why? Well, you're hanging out. Just be a band. What's wrong with you guys? So, but I, I get it too. But I remember that being something that struck me. Like you guys were still hanging out at coffee shops and stuff. Like, what oh is yeah, this? who breaks up and just hangs out? Well, it was funny because there, like, there was no personal acrimony in that way. If anything, which is super rare. Is yeah, what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. If anything, I would say it um, made our friendship stronger because that that stress was no longer on it. You know, it's it's hard to like. We also lived together for a year, which was horrible. Yeah, like, that's tough. Yeah, yeah, it was a bad decision. You're in each other's faces and in the rehearsal room too. Yeah, and, yeah. and we worked together at the same job. Yeah, it's just like you know. And then we moved out, and we like couldn't even look at each other for a couple months. Yeah, I get that. But you know, if somebody is not delivering on this whatever task that they're supposed to be doing for the band. Um, then you become annoyed with them yes. for that. So, but when the task is removed, then it's no longer a big deal. That's right. Yeah, that makes sense because you're like not resenting anyone for any to-do item. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And also, I think for us to be a part of the scene, you should be out like, you know, talking to people and like, well, who do we go with the shows with? Each other. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I get that too. Like you need, and, and you need to be kind of, operating on all systems go all the time to be in a band that's active like that's mm-hmm. actively pushing records or people sniff that out and they go they're not really trying that hard so it's never going to happen right yeah. so it's all or none these days um there's exceptions of course but yeah it's kind of like that's kind of the vibe yeah so when did you start writing songs um i first started writing instrumental music on the guitar no one's ever asked me this before hmm that's interesting 
So I don't really have anything prepared, but I remember being like in grade eight or nine playing guitar mm-hmm. and uh, a group of us, maybe grade seven even. And I was still, I started as a drummer, by yeah. the way. Um, I was playing drums and jamming with dudes. Okay. Yeah. How did that, like, did you have a drum kit? Yeah. Westbury. Okay. 1992 really? Westbury kit. Yeah. How did you get a Westbury drum kit? Oh, my dad bought it you, for me. Yeah. 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 Uh, I still have it. My kids bang on it and they take it apart. Stuff. Nice. Um, but I was playing drums for a while, and they're just people were not. I but what I really loved about music was the jam, like to jam. Uh-huh. It wasn't drumming. It was like I want to play a song with you. So I was always that way, like a song person. Like let's make something. Like it wasn't like or like let's play a cover of like a Pearl Jam song or yeah. whatever. And uh, we got a group of people together, and I think the first thing we ever wrote is, and I started playing guitar shortly after that because I was bored because I couldn't get enough people in to play. So I started playing guitar by myself because it was more fulfilling because you can hear the melodies and stuff uh, i tried drumming by myself for a while it did not stick uh and we started writing like kind of like little jams it wasn't it was very like melodic it was like f- almost like funky or something like uh-huh. like if you think of like spin doctors or a band sure, like fishbone yeah. or something yeah because that was the guys who were older were into that kind of stuff so i just followed along and that was the first stuff that we wrote was like a set of chords and then someone would do a solo on another, like a more experienced guitar player would do a solo. And that was the first stuff that I ever sort of wrote with someone. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then later that was the beginning of me like jamming in bands. And then I started writing stuff on guitar for myself, uh, but never really that interested in singing. It was more like guitar ideas yeah, and guitar riffs and stuff. And then singing came later for me when I was writing with some friends a lot and no one wanted, no one would sing. So I'm like, I'm just going to do it. Is it? Yeah. So that's what it just, I, I like. I'll just out do of it. necessity. Yeah, like somebody's necess- got to do it. Yeah. And none of my friends were really that confident. I wasn't either, but like, someone needs to sing, just sing the damn melody, whatever. Yeah. And then we started writing a lot of songs that had vocals and vocal and the lyrics were really great. It was very like uh, smashing pumpkins inspired. So very gothy. Okay. Well, I don't know what gothy even means back then. Like, do you remember pseudo- any titles? Oh I'm yeah. Just- like <laughs> one of the songs was called like the Baroness. <laughs> Oh wow! <laughs> like Game Serious. of Thrones stuff. It's like yeah, it was like metal almost. Yeah, but it was very like new romantics inspired. Like it was all clean guitars with a bit of distortion at the chorus. Gotcha. Like Smashing Pumpkins. So, yeah, and just copying that. But you know, I really it was terrible. My singing is un- ungodly when I was like eighteen and nineteen. Um, but I really like the guitar stuff. Yeah. Listen to it today. And I'm like, that's a cool guitar idea. So that was something I always enjoyed doing and, and still abide by. It's like some of those guitar ideas were pretty good. But yeah, the singing came later for sure. So the question I always wonder too is like, did you start writing complete songs or just fragments? Uh, complete songs. Once I, wow. When I was 17 and had been broken up with by my high school sweetheart and my friend uh, Ryan and I just had nothing to do in Moncton. We just wrote and wrote and wrote because it was like felt more like an accomplishment to have like a body of work. And some of those men made it onto a little tape and uh, yeah. And then we wrote and continued to write. Yeah. And then that grew into like writing other songs with other friends. And he was still there with me for a while. Then he decided he wanted to write fiction on his own. And I just kept writing music. And then that turned into in flight safety. Like, uh, from that would have been like like six seven years later yeah. that became that's when i started it always takes safety. longer than you think oh yeah that was from so 18 to 25 yeah seven years yeah. later i started in flight safety well i remember just like yeah. starting writing songs with and may, i played in bands with people who would bring songs in but yeah anytime that i'd written things it's like somebody would come up with a riff somebody would come up with another yeah. part and you cobble a song together like that and it just never even occurred to me that you could write a complete song on your right. own. Right? Yeah, no, I, I, that makes sense too because we did a lot of that too. But we, it's because we had the focus of like, let's start a band together yeah. and like try to add some friends and let's come up with some songs. So that was kind of like because we were both like, if we're gonna do it, let's just make a body of work. And, yeah. And, that, and I still, I still am a lot like that. I'm the guy in the jam room was like, what are we doing? <laughs> we don't need to play you know foxy lady by Jimi hendrix for fun we're good right like let's move let's let's make something or i'm gonna go like i'm really impatient like that okay like the jamming days like i'd entertain or maybe i would play a little guitar thing from something and then what's the bass player and guitar like somebody starts it and, and then, then like they're people, playing like uh um, yeah. i don't know a strokes riff i'm like okay yeah can we just I was like, just never that into it late. And as I got older, somebody to make the call that it's done now. (laughs) Yeah. 
Yeah. And of course, you'd indulge it and you'd scratch that itch that you had as a kid of like, oh, this is funny. We're playing the solo to Stairway to Heaven on these chords. It's hilarious. Yeah. Right. Like we play the end of Stairway or something funny. How do you, what is your stance on, I mean, maybe it's on a non issue at this point, but uh, band practice for the sake of band practice where you just play the same songs that you already know? Um, we would never do that. Because we're too impatient. Yeah, there's, too there's ADD. some value to like making sure you remember them because you actually. We might would do it before that. a show, so yeah. everything is project oriented with us. It was like we have a record, we need to be jamming, like yeah. new stuff, new ideas. Um, and but within that, we did leave enough free form to just play whatever. Yeah, here's an idea. Oh, that was cool. Let's try that. And we would try to. I would try to organize it pretty quickly though. Like, hey, that riff is cool. Let's take that. Yeah. Um, but with like practicing the set, yeah, we do it a couple times. And then come back another day, do it a couple times, and but you know only for shows. If there's no show, we're not playing the songs, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but we would practice for every show for sure. Yeah, when, especially like when they're like two months apart. We were doing like one at a time towards the end of the last album cycle. It's like yeah, we would practice for like three or four times before one show. We wouldn't be tour ready, so yeah, you want it to be good. Well, yeah. that's the thing. If you're playing every night on tour, then you don't need to do no. That when you're on tour too, like and you you can just bang off thirty minutes or forty five or an hour. Yeah. No problem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because you can't get that without touring. No, you can't. It never comes. Yeah. No, because you can't play locally that often. And it's really great when someone sees you when you're in that mode because you'll never play a better show than that. Yeah. Like just playing all the time. Yeah. yeah. So anyhow, you're talking about in flight. A lot A lot of your revenue or operation was based on um, film and TV. You were yeah, also speaking we would, at a uh, panel today. Talking about um, publishing today, yeah. Uh-huh. And writing for film and tv and yeah do you want me to talk more about that well i missed most of it so. okay yeah well uh it's i'm just a little a little bit curious it's all good how yeah. you landed there and what yeah. uh so uh now that i'm so in flight safety is my band i forget if we said the full name just in case um and people can check it out on all services i guess so uh yeah i do over the years i've kind of gone from being like this kind of full time in the band and sort of side on the side i would be doing uh, a little bit of producing and mm -hmm. composing for film and tv uh some co-writing with other artists and stuff like that so uh, after our last album cycle ended around 2016 i um uh, started doing producing and building up my studio uh, producing and composing more like absolutely full time now mm -hmm. so i could finally focus on recording other people and um Perf not perfecting uh sort of practicing you know getting better mixes and better sounds into tape and and coming up with stronger ideas and doing that every day all day so that's been three years now three and a half almost that i've been doing that and not being on the road and uh to that end i've been uh, in always as a job too like in addition to recording bands i'm writing for try to write for tv and film yeah. and, and try to and i write a lot of music for uh music libraries so not or one music library which is one that uh, is owned by bell and it's like ctv and much music and discovery and and uh, daily planet and stuff so i didn't even know this stuff existed yeah so me and my friend nick who's a saint john producer we've both been involved with working for bell is and that that's, nick and that's nick fowler yeah, yeah, yeah. so nick sure. does more edm and i do more like uh electro indie rock pop uh -huh. meets and in some cases i'll take a dive a deep dive into like I did some like sitcom-y kind of score, yeah, quirky kind of organs and stuff. Like I've done some East Coasty kind of like I've written some sort of almost Celtic like uh -huh. Water Boys kind of stuff for them. Okay, and, and, they, and they pay they pay you to do that, so that's a great job that I have. And it's not all the time; it's like one month every so often. I'm working on that stuff, and then I'm producing, and, and then I'm still writing. Um, I write for a music company that does uh works with advertising agencies so i'll get like a, a car commercial i'm supposed to write 30 seconds or a minute for and then they have a team of writers and i just be one of them so okay that's another job that i do how does that work it's pretty cool like it's it's intense work the advertising work because it's yeah. a quick turnaround i bet and it's very specific and you don't get the liberty of like finding out what the client actually wants you can just read a bunch of words okay that's called a brief you read it and you do the thing. Yeah. And and even the company that hires you isn't really at liberty to give you too many notes because they're so busy. They just need your song and then they're going to present it at a meeting. Uh, you and probably, I don't know how many, five to ten other composers would probably write on one commercial. Yeah. But you can get paid to do that. So that's kind of the gig. And then if you land the commercial, you could get more money. 
So I really enjoy that because the stuff that they asked me to write is in my kind of wheelhouse, like piano, rock, or like uh-huh. ambient building crescendos, or like in some cases, like maybe like a little bit of side chain on a synth bass, but then some guitars come in. and Right. So it, it combines a few worlds that I like. Yeah. So I do stuff like that. Or like maybe like a Honda commercial is often very like human, like a wedding here and a uh, little boy getting his hair cut for the first time. So they kind of create like that kind of vibe. And yeah. I like that because that's kind of like indie folk kind of stuff. Right. So I write a lot of that stuff and um, trying to do more work like that because I really do like that. But again, having to balance everything, it's good. I'm at a point where I'm tr- pretty busy. So we're trying to balance like still finishing these other records for bands and doing that stuff. That's like the challenge. I, uh, I was going to say, I've been, I played drums on a, commercial like a track for commercial yeah. once and i think it was maybe an online commercial was my friend was commissioned to do it maybe like he got a gig doing it and he was stressed out because the assignment was like basically like make it sound as close to this song as this reference track which is like a, a, a like pharrell song or something yeah i was gonna say pharrell or probably the black keys or cold play be one of those <laughs> right <laughs> it's yeah. almost always the same thing make it yeah. sound as close or as possible bony Bear now too yeah for right sure. Yeah, as close as possible without us getting sued. Yeah, <laughs> that's the thing. Uh, my my um, the company I work for doesn't do that. They just kind of give you the notes and they do give you some references sometimes. But uh, that's also a thing, and uh, it's tough. You got to turn it around quickly. It, the more you do it, like my workflow is designed for that now. So like mm-hmm. my drums are almost always mic'd if I want to go with the acoustic drums, or you have the sample libraries to go yeah. with the quicker route. And, your and, you, and you have your kind of mics and your preamps set on the guitars and the mics. So it's just like, or you can DI your guitars with like virtual amps and right. and, and everything. Like I pick up my bass, plug it into the interface and go. Yeah. So you kind of create a workflow that has to be pretty quick. You can't be like waxing like you do on a, a oh, Glory yeah. Glory record or an in-flight safety record. Dialing it doesn't it work in. like that, right? So a lot of VSTs and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in the VSTs for people who don't know, like in the box, kind of pianos and synths that are, they're not like... Uh, physical items just in the computer yeah what does vst stand for do you know <laughs> i don't remember but it's like virtual maybe sound S- something. Yeah. yeah it's like a protocol for a daw a daw like digital audio workstation okay like yeah. pro tools it's a protocol to get that kind of stuff in there and communicate to it yeah yeah i, I forgot i was actually thinking about the other day like i don't know what it stands for no i don't know either <laughs> virtual is definitely the first the, yeah yeah i know i've used them but it's gonna bore people if they're not into audio tech stuff I think that like this show runs that risk and I just <laughs> don't care <laughs> or I chop it out. One okay. Two. All right. Well, I have done some feature film stuff too. Like, so writing to a picture and, and some, sc- I wrote for like a mini series and stuff like that. And mm. I wrote a documentary score. How and do I you, like, that. like how, do you, how do you get connected? I don't know. I don't friends want to make of, you friends spill of all friends. your secrets. No, no, there's no secret. It's like you have relationships and, and I find lately, like lately in the last year and a half, I haven't done much to screen because the, people I have relationships with aren't really doing much right now. They're, they're in like in the process of maybe doing something else or like another movie. It's not ready yet. Or so, yeah, you have to have a lot of relationships that yeah. you'd be like the go-to composer and then you get used over and over. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's, it's really hard without a relationship to a director or producer. It'd be really hard to get, right. Just be cold called. And yeah. And that's, you, and you, you kind of have to have an in. Also just the juggling and balancing everything, which is like, that's the name of the game. If you are pursuing a career in, in this industry seems to be that there's no, it's like, it's not like you just have a job that you can show up at. It's more like, like finding work, doing it, making sure you don't take on too much at once, but making sure you don't have like dry periods where there's well, nothing you definitely end up taking on too much, but people are really good about like a band is really good about, Hey, we'll work on it next month at the end of the month. So I yeah. just have to do some other stuff for a bit. Yeah. Cause a lot of stuff, the reason that bands are even more okay with that than ever is cause they themselves are too busy yeah. with, with day jobs. Uh-huh. So that's another way you can game the system a little bit is like, they also have to work. Uh huh. So you can't, they, and a lot of bands I'm having some difficulties with some projects, um, in that I can't get people in the daytime and I, I have a family. So, right. So for me, like, It'll be four four p.m. to seven thirty p.m. as a blackout zone. Yeah, I can go back to the studio at seven until midnight, but like you know, you're tired and uh-huh. and you got to start the next day with like other stuff. So you run into the ch- and also weekends are with your kids. Weekends are yeah. no longer weekends; they're work. Like right. you're doing kid stuff. So uh, you can take a day here or there because you you know your partner could cover, but it's really taxing on your partner and stuff. Yeah. So it's I'm finding that that's been a challenge. So definitely evenings are the ticket there, but 
bands are great with with that because then you can then say, hey, I can't work on this until this time because they can't come in today anyway. So, yeah, yeah. So and it's tricky. probably like they are also saving up their money to get the thing. And yeah, to get their thing paid for to pay yeah. to pay the fees that they you know for the making a record. Yeah, it's a, it's a different time. Like I, when I started music, almost everyone I know who was recording records was like take two weeks off of whatever, and they'd all yeah. go to a studio and record a record, mm-hmm. and then maybe the singer would stay behind for an extra week. And, sure, and it was like normal. But yeah. now it's you never almost I almost never see that. Yeah. Right. Wow. Yeah, because you can imagine everyone has to work. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Outside of music, that is. Yeah. Especially on the East Coast. Especially. It'd be different in Toronto and LA. A lot of full time musicians, but yeah. for me being full time, and a lot of the artists are not. Yeah. Yeah. And even that, like, there's a lot of, you know, virtual sessions and those kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of working on your own and then just sending stuff to someone um, mm-hmm. in another city or something. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, I'll do some co-writing in person is always better in person, but sometimes someone will send me something and say, Hey, can you write a course for this? And I'll try and send it back. Mm-hmm. Like I'm working on something with, uh, uh, Frank from neon dreams. And like, I'll probably do most of that stuff in my studio and just send it to him, even though he's in Halifax, but he's busy. He's doing shows and yeah. touring. And so I'll probably do that stuff, send it to him, get the notes and then f- fix it up and send it back. So you mentioned um, scheduling can be a bit more of a challenge when you have kids. Was uh-huh. the decision to have kids and the decision to tour last, was that a conscious thing or is that this just kind of what's happened? It's a tough question because I don't know. Yeah. But it just kind of came at the same time. Mm-hmm. Like if we had kids when I was like 27, I guess we would have just done that. But like yeah. I was on the road a month yeah. and a half at a time. Right. Um, month here off for two months a month here three weeks here i don't know how i would have done that or how i would have felt about that it might have changed my trajectory right so it just kind of was um it was just coincidental in a way that like when roman was born it was still during the conversation so i was in like you know traveling a little bit but you could tell like it was like are you going to make another record was more kind of on the table in terms of having kids like Mm because that record had already been done and, uh, and then that means, are you going to make another record? Then are you going to promote it? Because mm-hmm. I, I really see no value in making a record if we're not going to promote it. I just, I never was of into course. that idea too much. I think now in my, uh, as I get older, I could see maybe making a record and just pushing it out. Just as a project. And, yeah, or making a few songs together. And yeah. I can see that for sure. And it'll you know, be up to Glenn if he wants to do that. But uh, I'm not sure I would want to do something without really pushing it. Because it's like, all oh, that work goes into those songs. I want people exactly. to hear them. Especially where we built up a bit of an audience. Um, but so, yeah, I could tell that I was not really interested in, uh, and I, I had a conversation with Glenn and I just sort of told him I'm not really interested in doing the whole album cycle again I don't think I can because I think that that was in some ways he was okay with he got that but I think he was maybe disappointed that we weren't making going to make music but I just for me it was all tied together I couldn't mm-hmm. just do one and not like promote it but I don't I don't want to speak for him I don't know what he was thinking but he was cool with it for sure he was very good and then uh, Roman was born and yeah so I ended up naturally focusing on mm-hmm. building up like in a lot of ways is building up my studio in a more professional manner because it was kind of always just a project studio that we would work in right and we'd have like half of it was rehearsal half was the studio yeah and gradually the studio just took over the whole thing and i just kicked everything out that was in studio so, right yeah so we still have our live set up there for if someone needed to rehearse i have yeah. that means i can do pre-production in there uh-huh. yeah because i want bands to play live for me so i can listen to them right so that's how i do pre-production is like we do it like a live thing with the pa and i listen to it and then we can make notes um i guess i i you may may have answered this kind of already um the the question that always occurs to me is like do you get tired of being on the road or that's just like for you it's all tied up in the album cycle and yeah it's all i never thing. got tired necessarily yeah i mean i got physically tired on yeah. the road but like the sort of philosophical tired no I was always ready to do it. Yeah. The odd time, like, oh, I don't want to fly to, I don't want to, f- well, I almost never wanted to fly certain places, but like, cause it's like a lot taxing on your body and stuff. Yeah. But there's something about me, like the curiosity would always, always obscure the tired. Yeah. I'm like, like one time, one of the last few runs of flights we did, we did like, I swear to God, it was like St. John, Paris, and then Moncton oh my God. in a row. Why? Why? Well, just that's where the shows were. Right. That's where the money was. Yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, the gigs, like those were the good gigs. Like we had a festival, festival, and festival. Oh, I see. You and know, in the summer, on, it's like yeah, we're, going yeah. to, we're going to, we're going to, there was a two days in Paris yeah. where I, 
I think, or or it must have been like Moncton St. John Paris or something. Like that's insane. Mm-hmm. And then another time it was like uh Calgary uh, Halifax Calgary Truro <laughs> like in a row because it's just we weren't that busy so the shows yeah. that were good and you needed to play you needed to play them yeah so one was a festival in Calgary like a, a multi-venue thing in, in February and then there was a Truro theater show and a Halifax show it was a private show we got to do them right so it was stuff like that um don't quote me on that but that was the kind of vibe uh so and I still did those. I kind of like the adventure of it. Like, let's just make this happen. Let's do yeah. it. And also, the more you do it, the more you can kind of like get it down to a science. Okay, this is what we need. We don't need this. Let's just get it done. Absolutely. And uh, of course, the, in the last few shows we did play, we were looking for certain amounts of money to do it or we weren't going to probably do it. So yep. there's a few things we probably never even considered doing at that. We were doing less and less like week at a time. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, like I found that we did a run of club dates in like 2015 in the fall. And I was like... This again, like that was a weird one. But when it was like the festival things or the private shows that are kind of like weird events and stuff, I like that stuff. But, and then, and then it but is this an like banging out five club dates, like trying to build up that Ontario audience again. Yeah. Uh, I don't know about that. That's tough. And I that's may not tough. have that in me. That might be true. Yeah. Yeah. I I mean, yeah, I, I asked myself that question. Yeah, 15 years later. I don't know if I have, I, I had it in me forever for a yeah. long time. Yeah. And I enjoyed it. But yeah, I've just like later in my career and I was like, what are we doing? <laughs> well, it also is like when the audience turns over and you, then you got to go to like whoever the new crowd. Yeah. Of. You got to win. You got to win that 19 to 30 year old audience or 20, 25. Yeah. Cause they're the music listeners. So they don't know you. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, it became, and it's not like I'm too proud to do that. It just got really hard. Sure. And like tiring. And you're not making that much money in those shows as you no. should be. So, you know, those are things you have to address and, yeah, that's kind of what that that was a, a a nail in our coffin for sure. It's just that you know, and you realize I I certainly had the realization playing a club show that was not that well attended. We're like close to ten years into, and we definitely have had victories. We played big shows, we played cool shows, sure. we got to travel, we got to make uh, records, um, but. You know, just having this, like, while I'm on stage, flash, like, what do I do this for? Well, I do it because I love the 45 minutes that I'm up here. Yeah. But if it's in service of that, there's a lot of work that goes into getting there. Yeah. That, like, is it really necessary to be doing this much social media in order to play? <laughs> yeah, I want you to start questioning, every, <laughs> questioning everything. Everyone has those gigs where every band that, uh, let me qualify it, every band that's over six years old. Yeah has those shows that make them go like, what are we doing? Like you're in, I don't know, um, Grand Prairie, Alberta. And you're like, why on yeah. Tuesday? And everyone has those shows and that's part of it. It's kind of fun. It's like in hindsight, it's funny. It's like, and one band member is going to go berserk and like uh-huh. go down a dark place. And that's going to happen to every band. I know it might be your turn. And, and, if, it do, and if it doesn't happen, <laughs> yeah. then you're probably not trying hard enough. Uh-huh. So yeah, I've seen true. it happen to other bands. It's happened enough. to us. It's happened to me. I've seen it happen to friends we've toured, toured with, and it's just kind of funny in hindsight now. Like, yeah, there I can name like I could name a band, and I know the city where it happened. I'm not going to because that's right. that's not that's not right. But yeah, I just remember certain bands just crashing, and then us having those moments where like. Even the weirdest shows broke us. See, we've played to zero people before. Uh-huh. We once yeah. played to zero people. And it was a noon show in uh, in Alberta, uh, like a nooner at a college. And there was no one there. And, well, the bartender was there, but then he had to go to the bathroom. Uh- <laughs> so there was a 1.0. <laughs> so we set a record of zero. Wow. He had to leave and go take a yeah, piss. Yeah, that's impressive. I don't think I've ever played to less zero. than bar staff. I've so definitely I've never, played to I did, staff. It was almost like... A philosophical experiment. Do you keep playing? Uh-huh. Do you wait till he comes back? But we just—is it still a show? At we that just point? played, and uh, yeah, does a tree fall in the woods or whatever? And if no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound? That was the same concept. So yeah, we've had those, and we've had, like you said, we've had some really fun shows and exotic places and stuff. So, but yeah, there's always that one show that a band will f- f- hit that brick wall. And it could, it could be, I'm not saying you have to be, it could be a band for two years and find that brick wall, but uh, yeah, it is pretty common in the later part of your career. Well, especially because like at the two year stage or wherever you're at in the early days, like you're like, well, of course it's like this because we're just right. getting started. Yeah. And then it gets dark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I always found like, I always enjoyed those shows. I always am glad that we did them because it's fun. Yeah. Um, you know, I can remember playing somewhere in Ontario and 
the place was basically empty, but there was this one really drunk guy who was just having a blast. And that guy makes the show worth it. Yeah. I remember that guy. He's often in front of the speaker. Oh, yeah. And like shirtless. <laughs> And just like, you're like, no one should be that close to a PA speaker that big. Yeah, right. And he's yeah. shirtless and just dancing. Sir, yeah. sir, you're not, it's, this isn't I've healthy. I've seen that guy. We probably played to the same guy. Yeah. And it's uh, one of the things I most appreciate about having is the experience of having done this is the kind of trivia you pick up, like the, the, the just ridiculous, like band, the nuances of being in a band and the, and like the stuff, like I know what that guy looks like. Yeah. It's kind of neat. <laughs> I kind of feel privileged that I know that guy. Yeah. And what the, what a cl- what a green room at a club like a 250 cap club looks like i know what that green room is like it's funny i like that i really enjoyed it. i felt at home at those places I, yes I, even though um it was hard i felt always felt at home in the rock club i never dreamed like growing up and being a pretty teetotaler guy like i was a computer geek and uh, i played sports and, and i played guitar all the time and, and growing up and was by the time i was 19 or 20 knew that music was going to be front and center as best I could. Yeah. And then, you know, slowly scaling back the other things I was doing in sport. And then I, I would have never in a million years thought I'd spend literally my twenties and thirties in bars and right. clubs, like almost all of them up until about 37, I was in a bar or a club for like all the time, all like the seeing time. shows at a festival, playing a show. Yeah. Yep. I know. I, probably spent like so many nights in club. I never dreamed that that would be me growing up because I didn't even really drink or anything. So funny. Um, I, I mean, I learned to enjoy a beer <laughs> like any other band, like, you know, and socially and stuff. But yeah, it was weird for me for sure. Oh, it's funny. Yeah. I was all about it growing up. Well, just in the sense of hey, like, I was, his own, yeah. I was the, um, like first kid that my parents had and you have to break all the rules for oh yeah 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 and so it was just like there was the rules around drinking were pretty strict like in my mind much too strict and so i did see it as my responsibility to um try and try and break the ice or whatever right but at the same time, you still have to do that. Like I was out in the country, you know, I didn't have anybody to buy beer sure. for me. But so when I got the chance, then you just like, I had to go through the, the period of like, you don't need to drink as much as you possibly can every time. Right. Like it's okay to leave some on the table. Like you'll have a better yeah, time. I think it's uh, and that's a whole other topic, but yeah, I, I had to personally had to learn to, in my case, I was so driven on like, I've got this music and I want to play it. I had to learn how to like do the social stuff and, mm-hmm. and like came from a bit of a alien, like I was kind of a bit more alien and that like I was music obsessed and guitar recording obsessed. Yeah. The guy who like would just stay in the, in the house for nights on end and forget that he wasn't doing normal things. <laughs> and people would say that, but he wouldn't internalize you. Like, could you, maybe you should do something else for a night. And I just was so obsessed. I was a bit obsessive and compulsive like that. So yeah, like going and spending my twenties and thirties in bars was a, was a big change, but I, I enjoyed it. I ended up learning how to enjoy that. And, um, yeah, definitely lots of crazy nights. Uh, right. Of, weird things happening for sure funny that like obsessive compulsiveness i think is also a bit of a prerequisite to do this at all well i mean i think so i think to be good at something yeah and just the other day in the shower i was thinking something funny um i came up with this thought it's probably not unique but i was like there's um there's getting good at something yeah anyone can do that but you also forget that you have to like look to you. You have to have a little bit of talent uh-huh. uh, to make a difference in terms of like to stand out. So you always have to find a balance between like nurturing your craft and then like, and also drawing on the talent that you have as a person. And, um, and I never really considered talent as something that I had. I was just like, I worked hard at it, but then, you know, the more you do, you go, oh, I guess I'm pretty good at that. And yeah. It's, it, I was reluctant to think about it that way. Maybe just stop worrying about everything being like not good enough and just let some of this, these ideas flow. And that definitely took me a long time to try to get a hold of and not be so worried about. Well, it's something that can be tough too, because it also is like you can see all of your own shortcomings and you know that working uh-huh. hard is the way to get better. And the, the, even the question of talent is like, 
Is it an inclination? Is it an ability? Yeah, it's probably. And who knows? I don't know what it is either. Like I, don't I just either. know. And when I say talent, just to qualify, I don't mean like, oh, I'm really good. I mean like you have a point of view. You have a point that, of view, that, and that, you have that's going to be you unique. Do well. that, and that, yeah, and you find that what that talent is, and you kind of like feature it, and you make it good through practice. Absolutely, yeah. but so maybe anyone could do it if you if you really break it down that way. So everyone has to have some point of view that could turn into music. But there are some but it people who have say to be music. There either. are some people. Like, yeah, for sure. There are some people that say I can't. I don't have musical talent or musical uh-huh. ability. And I guess that's true too, right? That, that happens. Thinking just like re- with regard to people's talents and letting yourself off the hook. For me, it was a thing like I struggled with music theory. It just didn't make sense. And I didn't understand that I'd never had to study in school. I could yeah. always squeak by. Um, so I didn't understand putting the work into that. Playing an instrument, I could understand that this person's better than me, and so I want to work to be as good as they are. Yes. Uh, music theory just didn't click. The only reason it's a problem is because I was in school. Sure. You know, <laughs> like you right. get out into the world, and it doesn't matter that I don't know the modes of the melodic minor scale. That has never and, mattered uh, yeah, before. Yeah, and, and or also, since. in what level of theory do you need to know, or like, do you want to call not knowing theory? I mean, the yeah. fact that you even know that means you know theory. I use a certain amount of practical theory, but it's don't really have it memorized as much as I have somehow internalized it uh-huh. it's like in my brain. Um, and then the more you do it, the more you hear, like the more you can hear what's going on and describe it quickly to someone. Um, Cause there's a basic language. You have to know a basic language when you're talking to someone about playing music or producing someone. Um, you don't have to, I could explain it to someone like, Hey, this is an interval I'm trying to get yeah. out of you. Or something, and but it's cool when you kind of have the basics. But I never really, I didn't thrive in like notes on the staff. I did terrible at that, and I studied at uh, a couple courses in university. And the only way I could get the notes on the staff, like in those little exercises, was I'd had to draw a piano, yeah, or a guitar. I would think of a guitar and sometimes I would draw it and then look at the notes and go backwards. Oh, it sucks. So I really, if I had to transpose, I would transpose it on guitar, then I'd write it out later. Yeah. So because I don't know how to do that stuff, like it never really clicked for me myself either. But but musical constructs and like the math of music really clicked for me. Patterns. I'm a pattern guy. So Uh that clicked for me for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I but I think that's like I think that's valid and I think that's cool and it is something that like can be celebrated as opposed to like everybody should be equally adept at everything because I also think that is a thing if you focus too much on that you are at risk of getting rid of whatever makes you personally interesting or like yeah. whatever your unique thing is. Yeah, no, I think and I think being self-taught is is a gift in some ways too. And a lot of us are self-taught. Right. And I did later decided to like in university, I, I took an introductory course just to figure I should know. Yeah. I'm here at university hating it anyway. <laughs> I might as well, I really wanted to play music. I might as well take a music course and it was good. I'm glad I did. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I learned a bit, a bit of stuff, but not all of it stuck. <laughs> All right, uh, we have gone for longer than I intended. <laughs> I told you. I cool. told you we could. I could yammer on about this stuff. Thanks for having me on this podcast. I don't even know the name of. It's called Hitmakers. Okay, <laughs> now I do. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks for having for, me on Hitmakers. Thanks for coming on the show. All right, fun one, right? Thanks again to John for being on the show. Thanks to you for being here. You, the listener, you're the best. You can find John's music and some video and uh, merchant stuff at inflightsafety.ca. If you've got a band, you can hit him up to produce and record your music in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada at his studio uh, at John Mullane on Twitter. J-O-H-N-M-U-L-L-A-N-E. I'm looking at it right now. And uh, you can find me at learndrums.ca for the time being. And I kind of scraped everything off there except for the podcast and a video highlight reel of stuff I've done. But it's pretty fun. You should watch it. I might, it might take you a half hour to get through all of it. You'll enjoy it. All right. Thanks for being here. Talk to you next week. <laughs>